Hello, my friends. Welcome to Origins. My name is Don Chapman. It's great to have you with us today. You know, Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. Today, we have Dr. Russell Humphreys with us. Dr. Humphreys, how good to have you here. Always a pleasure. Now, we, you are, uh, just for folks who are joining us, you are... Um, a uh, PhD in, in physics from LSU, and then you worked in New Mexico. Tell us about your work at the Sandia National Laboratories. Well, that's a sister laboratory to Los Alamos, the more famous one. Uh, both of us work on atomic and nuclear weapons, and uh, Sandia is about 7,000 scientists and engineers, more, more engineers and scientists, and uh, they're more engineering-oriented, project-oriented. But uh, it was a great experience for me. I learned more physics there than I thought I could possibly learn, and I learned a lot of, about the geoscientists, too. My first project there was to drop a, a probe down into an empty oil well hole, a borehole, and uh, develop this probe to find out what elements were down there. In the process, I learned a lot about oil uh, drilling and other kinds of geoscience. And you had a successful career there from 1979 to 2001. And then during the latter part of the time you were there, you were working part-time as a, in, in creation science research and then in, since 2001, full-time in creation science research. Yes. Uh, I'd say actually I started creation science research before I came to Sandia even. Oh, wow. But I was doing it in my off hours and my weekends. When, as we begin to, to look at uh, your, your presentation today, uh, how do we put together scientific evidence and scripture? How do you deal with those issues? I was an evolutionist, and uh, most people grow up thinking that all creationists were born that way, and they grew up in Christian families, but I didn't. You and, didn't grow up in a Christian family. But uh, I think it's instructive for people to know how a scientist is trained and where he gets some of his ideas about evolution versus creation. So it was the evidence of science as well as the Word of God? Yes, uh, science evidence was important. Also, the, the Bible was. Well, what is the actual evidence? All these years I've been told that the earth is old, but nobody except for one, maybe one textbook had one sentence that might have given me one shred of evidence. Uh, nobody has really to borne down on the evidence. What is the actual evidence? And I had the strong feeling that I was on to something then, uh, that I was on the right track. And uh, I found out that there's very little evidence for billions of years, and that there's a whole lot of evidence for thousands of years. A few years ago, back in the late 80s, um, Dr. Steve Austin, a creationist geologist, and I were doing a paper on salt going into and out of the ocean, sodium going into and out of the ocean. And I, I wanted to check out this with a local geochemist who worked for Sandia National Labs, just as I did. And, uh, and geochemistry is the study of chemical elements in the ocean, such as sodium. And I wanted to find out if he knew of any way for large amounts of sodium to get out of the ocean, or at least had some guesses. And uh, it turned out he didn't know, and that uh, on the basis of that alone, the ocean would be much younger than billions of years. I, I had said, well, you know, uh, it doesn't look like enough sodium is getting out of the ocean. It looks like the ocean has to be very young. And he says, no, there must be a way that enough sodium is getting out of the ocean. We just haven't discovered it yet in 80 years. But we know that the ocean is 3 billion years old, so there must be a way. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> Tell me more about that. How do we know? And he started to cite a little bit of other evidence. And, uh, uh, and I said, well, I have a lot of data on, on those subjects. There were other subjects besides geochemistry. And uh, would you like to take a quick look at some of that? And he said, no. He said, I won't look at your data until people I trust say it's OK. So I said, who is it you're trusting? And it turned out to be Stephen Jay Gould, who isn't a geochemist. He was a paleontologist right. who was a foremost uh, advocate of evolutionary paleontology. But I was amazed that this young man, he was still in his uh, mid-30s, didn't see the illogic of his own position. He was trusting Stephen Jay Gould not to be doing the same thing in his own field that this young man was doing in his field, geochemistry. 
That's amazing. Now, we've been taking evidence. You say there's, a, there's somewhere between 100 and 200 different ways that we can look at things that would measure in some way the age of the uh, universe and the age of the earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, you took 14 of those key ones in an article that you wrote some time ago. Will you remind us of that article? Oh, sure. Let me show you a picture of it. This is an internet article and it documents 14 items of this young world evidence. And I did it for the Institute for Creation Research in June 2005. And uh, you can find it on icr.org, and it gives you references. Now, on, on a previous show, we listed, I believe, nine of the 14 evidences that you have in that article. That's just a sample. That's yeah. good, some incredible samples. And I urge the people to remember the preponderance of the pile of the evidence, not just the individuals. But yeah. one of the things that, at the end of the show, you said that it was like 90-10, that you believe 90% of the evidence hinted towards a... Uh, a uh, young earth, but there was 10% of the evidence that maybe hinted at an old earth. But today you want to speak to those issues that were in that 10% category. That's exactly right. Uh, and uh, I'm excited for you to do that, especially this first one that talks about carbon-14. Right. Everybody tells me you can take carbon-14 and you can date the earth and you can find out it's billions of years yeah. old. Yeah. What do you say to those folks? Well, I say carbon-14 has now turned around and we use it to show the world is not billions of years old, but only thousands. It's become the friend of creationists, so. We'll be anxious to see your evidence for that because there's a few skeptics out there right now when I just heard you say that. Yeah. So please share, uh, so you've is, worked in this area pretty extensively. Yes, uh, on the radioisotopes in the Age of the Earth project, I was a co-author with Dr. John Baumgardner and several other people uh, on carbon-14. And so uh, one of the shocking things that most people don't know, and they don't know why it's shocking yet, but is that all fossils have young carbon-14 ages. Now, if you don't know why that's a shocker, uh, I need to explain. Uh, this is from standard radiocarbon journals. And things like coal, wood, shell, bone, marble, natural gas, CO2. Uh, this is from standard journals that deal with carbon-14 and they all found carbon-14 in them. So they're radioactive. Now, carbon-14 decays pretty fast. It's got a half-life of only 5,700 years, you know, a little less than 6,000 years. So after a million years of decay, there would be no carbon-14 atoms left in any fossil. Yet all these fossils are supposed to be older than two million years, and a lot of them hundreds of millions of years old. So it was a trade secret of the radiocarbon community uh, for many years that uh, this was happening. But it turns out that uh, it really supports a young world. Conventional age is millions of years. The standard carbon-14 age of all of these is less than 70,000 years. And the average is about 50,000 years, but when you correct the assumption that goes into carbon-14 for what the Genesis flood did to the situation, then the age drops to about 5,000 years. That's so, amazing. Yeah, carbon-14 is now the friend of creationists. That's amazing. Now, diamonds play a part in uh, bringing this all to the head, head as well, don't they? Yes, that's right. Uh, it has to do with the excuse that people use. All the labs assume that somehow modern carbon was getting into the fossils and that has a lot of radio for carbon-14 in it. Uh, so we tested that assumption with the diamonds, like you're mentioning. So, in other words, uh, the, the explanation they would give for the carbon that was there is that somehow a new carbon was getting yeah, into like, the old like fossils. Say fungus got into the coal somehow. And but the modern you found the hardest carried. thing you could find where there couldn't be contamination. Right. Diamonds. And what do the diamonds teach us? They have young carbon-14 ages, too. Nobody had ever measured diamonds wow. uh, because uh, you can't contaminate them internally, so they wouldn't, wouldn't expect any carbon-14 to get in from the outside. And uh, the labs don't contaminate them externally. They've taken great precautions not to do that. And uh, we use the world's best carbon-14 lab, and its specialty was small amounts of carbon and they had 20 years of experience. And these things are from the depths of the earth. 
which are supposed to be billions of years old. So the conventional age for these diamonds was between one and two billion years, hmm. dated by other methods, other radioactive methods. But the carbon-14 gives you an average of 58,000 years. That's the standard, and we think the assumptions on that are wrong. If they're corrected, uh, we think that uh, uh, it's probably 10, less than 10,000 years. Now, uh, the other side came up with a thought that underground neutrons are somehow generating carbon-14 in the diamonds, and that was a good theory, uh, but the problem is the measured amounts of underground neutrons are too low. And so uh, helium leakage from radioactive zircons deflates the billions of years. This is the next item on item 10. At a well in Los Alamos, New Mexico, uh, researchers there recovered some microscopic crystals of zircon. That's zirconium silicate. It's in almost every granite there is. And uh, all of these contain uranium. When zircon forms, it grabs uranium from the surrounding lava. And, uh, and it rejects lead, so it's an ideal lab for radioisotope studies or you know, radioactivity studies. So we noticed something about the helium that uranium decay makes. It makes helium as well as lead. You've heard of alpha decay? Yes, sir. Yeah, alpha particles are helium nuclei. So when a uranium atom decays, it spits out an alpha particle and that stops somewhere and grabs two electrons and becomes a full-fledged helium atom. And in the size zircons we were looking at, a lot of them would stop, the alpha particles would stop inside the zircon. So I'm going to show you how many helium atoms a uranium atom makes as it decays down to lead. So we'll count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if we know how much lead was in, uh, is in a crystal now, we know that that crystal from experiment, we know that zircons don't like lead, so they will reject it when they're forming. So if you know how many lead atoms are in the crystal, then you know how many helium atoms were deposited. And that's important. Now, another thing you can do is date this from looking at the lead and looking at how much uranium is left and taking today's decay rate and you will get a date that way. And you get one and a half billion years, which is consistent with evolutionary ideas about the formation it's from. So now that helium leaks. It's known that helium wiggles through a crystal and out into other uh, surroundings. Leaks into the mica that surrounds it. Mica is that flaky, shiny stuff in granite into the mica, which is called biotite. So the helium leaks out, and usually it leaks pretty fast. So it was surprising to find so much helium still left. Now the question is, how much is left? So here's the depth in miles, half a mile down to two and a half miles, and the temperature gets hotter and hotter, up to 277 degrees centigrade. That's hotter than your oven gets. And here's the percentage of the helium that we know was deposited that's still in those crystals, 80% in the top, and then it diminishes down to a tenth percent at the bottom, 58%, 42 That's a lot of the helium that's left, and this surprised everybody who heard about these results the first time it happened. So we duplicated those results, but uh, this time we wanted to find out how long it would take for the helium to leak out. So now I'm going to do a graph. Now, I know a lot of the audience is afraid of graphs. <laughs> Are you afraid of graphs? No, oh, okay. I've never been bitten by a graph. Okay, that's a good attitude. Graphs are our friends. So, but I'll show you, set up the graph. We're going to plot leak rate versus temperature. So along the bottom here is temperature. And I'll just uh, show which way temperature goes. It gets hotter moving this way. And the color gives you a clue. And then the leak rate is vertical, faster and faster as you go up. And this is a tremendously compressed graph, a factor of a trillion from sure. top to bottom. We used the data about how much helium was left okay. to, dis to make some predictions about how fast the helium would be leaking when we measured it. And, uh, and so uh, uh, we made predictions based on either 6,000 years here 
or one and a half billion years. And of course, the one and a half billion years would have much lower leakage rates because uh, it has to stay in the zircon much longer. So uh, now I want to show you the data. I want you to see this because this is, uh, it, it's very surprising. I don't know of any other way to convey the surprise than to show the graph. OK, here, here are the percentages, um, 42, 27, those percentages in the table I showed you before. And th that tells us how much helium was lost. And if it was lost in 6,000 years, you would have these diffusion leak rates. Technical name is diffusion. The real name is leak. And if it was slower in one and a half billion years, then the leak rates would be much lower. So there's a factor of 100,000 difference between these numbers and these numbers. And we predicted this in print in a book that was published in 2000 AD before we had any measurements made. And then we got some measurements made. We commissioned heat helium leak rate experiments. And this is the borehole, uh, what comes out of the borehole. It's about this big around. Ground up the rock, extracted the zircons, put it in the, we didn't put it in the experimenter. We got uh, put it in. And he was an evolutionist. And we went through an inter intermediary, so he didn't know he was doing creationist work. And uh, we can compare our, the measured rates that he got with the predicted rates that we made. So here's the prediction again. And here are the data. Wow. And they fell right on that. Perfect on the line. Yeah. So anybody who's a techie says, wow. That <laughs> and that's what I said when I first saw it. In fact, I didn't believe it at first. I thought I'd made some mistake. Uh, but uh, so it really resoundingly verifies the 6,000 year prediction. That's and amazing. It really rejects the uh, one and a half. So this is the data, the blue dots lining up with the red. And uh, it just completely rejects the other model. I've never seen in my scientific life anything it, that badly rejected or that. It, it's that such a perfect accepted. line. It's amazing. Yeah, the leak rates are so high that the zircons have to be very young. So we took the measured losses, and in effect, the math is more complicated, divided by the measured leak rates, and we got a date for it. And it's 6,000 years, give or take 2,000. Plus or minus, yeah. And that's, um, that's just amazing to me uh, that, that we would get this. But yet, the same zircon gives you a one and a half billion years when you use the conventional uranium to lead dating. So that says that God must have speeded up radioactive decay during that period. And a lot of other lines of evidence from the radioisotopes and the Age of the Earth group uh, show the same thing. In incredible research and uh, very valuable research. Uh, folks, it's just amazing that as more and more research is done, as science really digs into this, that even the evidence we thought pointed towards an older Earth is beginning to line up on the side of a young Earth. Dr. Humphreys is doing some amazing work. He's going to share with us when we come back uh, how you can look a little more deeply into the work that's being done. Don't you go away. We'll be right back. Creation versus evolution. You weigh the evidence. Mount St. Helens, a new geologic story. There is extensive evidence that the layers of strata in the geologic record have been laid down very quickly, similar to the processes observed since Mount St. Helens erupted. The major formations of the Earth's crust are sedimentary rock beds formed by rapid erosion, transportation, and deposition by water. Rapid global formation of sedimentary rock beds is evidence that the Earth is thousands, not millions of years old. Today's guest on Origins, Dr. Russell Humphreys, is a physicist and speaker with Creation Ministries International. Russ did scientific research for 22 years at Sandia National Laboratories and has published some 20 papers in secular scientific journals. He is the author of Starlight in Time, where he proposes a model for a young universe. Book orders are being taken at 800-616-1264. Russ has also been involved with The Rate Project, which has produced breakthroughs on the subject of radiometric dating. Dr. Humphreys can be reached at Creation Ministries International 
P.O. Box 350, Atlanta, Georgia 30127. Or visit the website, www.creation.com. We're back with Dr. Russ Humphreys, and he's been talking to us about evidence that used to seem to point towards an old Earth is now pointing towards a young Earth, carbon-14 and helium leakage, some amazing research that you were able to do with the RATE team. Tell us a little bit more about the RATE team, will you, Dr. Humphreys? Well, it's uh, radioisotopes and the age of the Earth, and on this very program, you had the leader of the project, Dr. Larry Vardaman. He was an excellent scientific project leader, and another m member of the team, uh, Andrew Snelling, and we had six other men on the team, including myself. And all creation scientists, but all with a different area of expertise. That's right. But there's a technical book that documents all of our results. Uh, it's uh, technical. I should emphasize technical a lot. So for people who really have a background in science and really mm -hmm. want to say, is this evidence valid and really look into what you're studying, I think the carbon-14 is probably pushing some buttons and some people who want to say, That's how can exactly they be right. saying that? And there is a book that gives all the scientific validation of your work. And it's an excellently done book. It uh, really is. Dr. Snelling was one of the editors, and uh, we uh, had a, a bunch of different expertises brought together on it. It's really worth it if you're a technical person. Now, for the other people in the audience who are not techies, there's a layman's book, Thousands Not Billions. And this was written by Dr. Don DeYoung, who is also on the team. He's a physicist, but he's also a very good popular science writer. And uh, that's available on creation.com and other creationist websites. And this would be understandable to the layman who has an interest, but perhaps not as deep a background in the material. Right. Don will go through all the background. So. And you can get that with a DVD as well, which I yes, think is really a, exciting. Yes, a DVD that has the same name and several others. Now, here's a non-technical book that has many details also, uh, the Creation Answers book, and it has chapters on cosmology, too, if you're worried about how the light from distant stars got here, carbon-14, and plate tectonics. That's another subject that hasn't been touched. So there really is beginning to be quite a volume of material for people who seriously and objectively want to look at the evidence. There's more and more evidence there to look at, isn't there, my friend? Yes, I, uh, I think we have every reason to be happy about this. So the young world makes sense out of science. And like I was saying, uh, the evidence for a young world vastly outweighs the evidence for an old world. But things have happened so that the rate data explains these nuclear dating ages, carbon-14 uh, and diamonds. Carbon-14 has changed sides. And the rest of the old Earth evidence is coming off the scale. So we want you to know about this because we want you to trust the Bible. Because if you can't believe that verse, you really can't believe John 3.16 either, can you? That's right. Dr. Humphreys, you've done a great service for us. I want to thank you for your service. Well, Forty years you've been uh, helping to accumulate valid and objective a scientific research that helps us to see the truth of God's Word and that, in fact, we have a young earth. And uh, all of the church and all, uh, really should be grateful for the incredible work that men and men like you have done. So on our behalf, we want to thank you, and we want to thank you for being here today with us on Origins. And friends, we're so glad you've joined us on Origins as well. I hope that we've made you think today, and I hope we made you want to dig deeper into the scientific evidence. But most of all, I hope that we've helped you to believe that you can trust your Bible with all your heart, and you can trust the God that the Bible reveals, the God who loved us so much that he became a man in Jesus Christ to die for our sins that we could have the precious gift of eternal life. Beyond, above all of that, I want you to remember this today, my friend, that it's God's view that He created you. That should be your worldview too. So I hope you'll join us soon again here in Origins, and until then, God bless you, my friend.
thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file of program number 909 from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 909, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.